Um, that's a really, it's a really great book that you have here at Masaya. Uh, reading through it, it explains the concepts much very intuitively. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, so I must say um, it, it's been quite helpful. I think my first question is on, so you uh, relying on the, the document you sent, there's the interpretability, there's the, I think it's the second, the second project really. Uh, mm -hmm. that's been laid out that pretty much stays on on interpretability and I guess the first point of call was just truly trying to get the bed down of interpretability and I just wanted to ask you a question on that because we found that um, there doesn't seem to be a much clear-cut definition of interpretability this is yeah. to say there could be a post hoc look at what the algorithm that you have implemented gives but uh, my understanding of the interpretability would be that you're pretty much trying to give reason to probably how the artificial neural networks came to a particular um, value, right? So I think I would just like to start it off with that on that point of um, pretty much dissecting the interpretability from a post hoc perspective and to, uh, to the actual implementation perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So in terms of interpretability i mean uh, as you mentioned there can be like different ways to approach interpretability and if you look at the document that i've sent yeah. so i've just given few ideas there so one example would be so uh, for example let's say you you are doing a trading strategy using reinforcement learning uh, you see that so so the input that goes to the trading strategy would be the state variables which mean that the volume at that point of time or or how much is the increase or decrease in the stock price at that point of time and output will be buy sell or hold so one way to go about it is that okay in case the input is the increase in the market by 15 percent output is like hold or buy so you can see these kind of uh, behavior between your state variable and the output so that might be like one way to go about it in terms of interpretability and then there are a couple of other approaches that I've mentioned as well. If you look into the uh, in, in, into the uh, file that I sent across to you guys, and uh, there can be, I mean, if you look at supervised learning models, there can be like different ways of uh, doing the interpretability, and reinforcement learning might be slightly different. And and one way would be <clears throat> trying to understand what's happening inside the neural network, and and again for that there can be different ways and and you can go through the literature and there are different ways in the literature to to, un to understand that but the key aspect of this particular uh, project is that if you are running a reinforcement learning based trading strategy i mean that there are a lot of papers written on that uh, the purpose is to understand what's happening inside the model and there can be like different ways uh, one another approach can be you can compare it against some of the well-known strategy. So for example, there is thing, there are things like Pharma French model, there are some technical analysis. So you can feed the same set of data to the reinforcement learning model that you have trained and see whether it's doing the same kind of thing that the well-known strategies are doing or not. So here, what I'm doing is I'm just throwing the ideas. As you mentioned, it's a very open-ended question as of now, interpretability, especially in the reinforcement learning space is something which is not very well studied. And these were a couple of ideas that I came across when I was doing the literature review, I was writing the book. And that, that is what I've given to you guys. So see if you can like explore a couple of them that I've mentioned here, if that makes sense. No, it really does. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, I think I, I, think I actually really wanted to, to so that I hadn't missed maybe an industry standard or a convention that exists, um, mm -hmm. say in, in, in applying certain reinforcement learning models, whether or not there's, there's one that exists, but um, I think you've explained it quite well. Thank you. Um, I, I know, but that's a good point. I, I, I think there are a couple of industry standards which are there for the supervised learning models. So for example, yes. you see things like feature importance, how much important is the feature when you run, uh, let's say our random forest model or logistic regression model, you can figure out these kind of things using some technical models. So there are ways to look at the interpretability that things like, uh, uh, I mean, there are a couple of models uh, or methods which are being used for interpretability for supervised learning. For, for reinforcement learning, at least I am not aware of some 
uh, uh, industry standard for uh, interpretability or given my literature review and given my experience or given my discussion with people uh, this is something they are struggling with as of now and and i think uh, there is no industry standard at this point of time i would say thank you very much um, building on the building on the idea of kind of industry standard i'm glad that got brought up because one of my questions is um sample size um c car some of these dfast models they're they're known and kind of the regulators want a certain sample size for these models is that the same for this in other words um do these do our models in practice um require a specific sample size and the reason i'm asking this question is if we're going to do it might as well we do it the way industry does it um is that mm -hmm. do, do you possibly have a comment on that yeah so i have a high level view on all the machine learning models so if the sample size is small generally you prefer statistical models right if 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 there are if the number of observation is not very high you might not be able to train your machine learning models quite well so in that sense especially for like regulatory stress testing things like ccar and dfast i have worked with couple of teams in my organization as well so yeah. they have kind of like quarterly data or monthly data and the number of uh, sample size or observations are limited right so in 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 that sense or or in that context people generally prefer the basic uh, models statistical models maybe linear regressions or they try to like do things like lasso and stuff which are yeah, regularized yeah. regression but they don't go beyond that and they don't look at like machine learning models and all machine learning models reinforcement learning models all these are generally in a very broad sense these are used when the sample size is pretty big because that is where it makes sense to train data and because you have like a lot of layers and a lot of nodes a lot of parameters to train when let's say you are using artificial neural network and with less number of data with small sample size you might not be able to train it well and the model might not be very stable so if you are working on machine learning my perspective would be the sample size should be much bigger than what you're using for the normal statistical models okay. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I wanted to follow up with a specific thing in the book. So um, when you define the aging class, one of the methods is model. Um, you use a dense, you, you use uh, four, dense, four dense layers. Um, my question is, um, why not use an LSTM given the auto regressivity of the data? Which case study you're referring to? Um, this is case study one, one. Uh, chapter, chapter nine, um, page 306, you def uh, when, when you're defining the aging class, uh, mm -hmm. one of the methods is underscore model, and there's four dense layers. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, you have the flexibility to use okay. any kind of neural network there. It's, it's what we thought, it's, we thought of like just going with the basic stuff, uh, no, a basic neural network. With less number of layers, and and you can of course throw in LSTM, and and all all these kind of stuff, and there are advantages and disadvantages of using that. I mean, if you have LSTM, you'll have to uh, train more number of parameters. Training time would be higher, yeah, and, yeah. and and so on and so forth. So I mean, you can think about it. I mean, in, in industry and in academia, people are doing all these LSTM because this has like time series uh, or temporal oh, yes. properties. Yeah, so. It's up to you, but but I we just try to be simple there. Okay. Yeah. Um, and to the point of frame, uh, we, we we started digging into this as well. Uh, GPUs. Um, so I know my machine is powerful enough. Um, the question is, is it going to be able to handle something like this? I don't know. I've trained LSTM in my computer, and it's fine. It's pretty quick. Mm -hmm. um, the question is, I don't have uh, a separate external, oh, sorry, a separate internal GPU. I have an integrated GPU in my CPU. Mm -hmm. Can we use Google Collab? It's yeah, a, yeah. Because even I have, uh, even I don't have a very powerful GPU. So I end up using like Google Collab. I, I, I like that because you can easily integrate it with uh, GitHub as well. So you put a, put like, let's say Jupyter Notebook on GitHub and you can open that GitHub Notebook from Google Collab make changes and save it back to GitHub. So, okay. yeah. 
Hey, I have a quest, maybe follow follow up on the uh, first question that, that Matilla talked about. Because um, seeing the uh, deep Q network, uh, we have those um, very key function which the experience replay. So mm -hmm. we have some, um, it's more like a supervised learning model because you are feeding into some, uh, a small batch of the observations from the past. Mm -hmm. So intuitively, I was thinking that is that um, how we set the parameters of the model and how we uh, structure the, uh, like the batch size, the memory size for the uh, function is that going to lead to maybe a direct impact on how we interpret the model afterwards? So I didn't get your question exactly. You were saying that uh, the experience replay is more like a supervised learning algorithm? Yeah. Is yeah, I mean, there is a, if you think about it, there's a minor difference between, and that's a very good point, uh, but there's a minor difference between supervised learning and the experience replay. And that is, that in supervised learning, your target is kind of constant. You know it before running the model, but in experience replay, the target is not constant, right? It keeps on changing because it comes from the Q value of the trained model from the previous experience replay, right? So that's the difference. And, and when you run a lot of batches, one after another, the output or the target also keeps on changing. So you can't think of it as a, a supervised learning model as such. But in terms of interpretability, I, to be frank, I didn't get your point that how do you, how will you approach the interpretability of this uh, experience replay from the supervised learning framework? If you have any ideas, I mean, feel free to like uh, mention it and then we can, of course, brainstorm. Yeah, it's just, I'm just thinking like from the point of the theory, but we, because I haven't really uh, implemented the model yet, but we'll right, see. Right. Yeah, yeah that, that's a fair point. And, and there are different ways you can think about the interpretability. And one example that I gave was that if you change the, your state variable, meaning the, uh, the change in the stock price, which goes as the input to the model, you see what, what's the impact, whether the algorithm is going for buy, say, uh, buy, sell, or hold, and you can make some kind of Q table. So the document that I sent across to you guys, there is one bullet point in which I've mentioned this, de this detail about the Q table. You can have some kind of heat map and say that, okay, if the market increases by 4%, 5%, 3%, this is what the algorithm is doing, and it's kind of intuitive, right? Um, I think... I think just building up on that, I think uh, just going forward then, I, I just wanted to ask um, on the four on the four topics that we have, would you would you have us work on one deliverable currently or um, what would be the most optimal way of, of, of actually looking at this? I'll give an example. I was look I was I've been pretty much working a lot more on the fourth fourth mm -hmm. uh, question, the one that has the deep hedging. I think uh -huh. I was I found that interesting because the implementation of the paper that's provided by Hans, I think it's Hans. Yep. Yeah, I yep. found it quite intuitive to apply. So mm -hmm. I was thinking since in that paper, they seem to be probably looking at a PNL impact. Maybe mm -hmm. we could look at a, I don't know, other metric on that and build on that. I was just trying to find out from your perspective. How. Yeah, let's, I, I would say let's, let's step back a little. And uh, there are four projects that I've given. So my expectation or my understanding was that, I mean, one of you or each one of you might like select one of the project and uh, depending on your, I mean, whatever you are interested in and whatever you want to do, or you might not even choose one of them. And, and, and then we can proceed. We can have like a bi-weekly meeting. You can have a discussion with me, maybe one-on-one -on, -one on a bi-weekly basis and see, we can see the progress. And that is what I thought about uh, how to go ahead with it. Coming to each and every project, I mean, uh, uh, or, or talking about the project four, I, I would say that yes, it's it's a good one. It's very close to what we are actually doing in a couple of companies or a couple of banks. Uh, they are actually Im uh, implementing all these deep hedging, and and uh, there have been like uh, there has been significant progress in in deep hedging related stuff. And uh, my 
idea for this was that in this paper you have the deep hedging algorithm implemented for call option and there can be different uh, different types of exotic option for which you can apply deep hedging so i thought about doing it for maybe asian or maybe doing for binary option digital option and these kind of things and see whether it works for them or not and the way you can train or the way you can uh, uh, create a model for for all these different kind of option is very similar to what has been there in the paper and there is one example in my book as well uh, for deep hedging if you go to chapter 9 case study 2 i think yeah so you you can take like uh, reference from there all right thank you thank you very much yeah So I wanted to return to the kind of the topic of interpretability for two. Uh, actually, before I continue, um, so if that's the case of us taking each taking one of the projects, uh, Professor Zar, should we kind of go ahead and split up, or what? What's your take on that? Well, I mean, obviously, it depends. You know how you feel about the ability to do it on your own. I mean, uh, even when we talk about interpretability, there's a bunch of interesting potential sub research. I mean, I don't know about the other projects yet. So far we've been talking about credibility. Um, there's, a, there's enough meat in there for somebody to be, to do a bunch of things. So yeah, I mean, if you are able to, um, and don't forget, I'm gonna see if I could get some uh, undergraduates as well to participate in some of these projects so that you have some additional help in case you need it. I mean, you, you, you kind of tell me, I mean, uh, Obviously, I think we want to benefit Arium the most because the more stuff you bring to him, right? The more, the more, you know, thinking I'll get to do because you do a lot of the legwork for him. So that's, and and also you get to to work on different things. So yes, I mean, uh, if you think that there is enough uh, for you to work on each of them, because I don't want too many people working on one thing because then you have the management issue, right? You have to kind of split the work and. Um, that becomes, I don't I want to make, it needs to be more of a research driven approach rather than a product driven approach because then you have to deal with the management of it. Um, so right now, who is interested in interpretability? I'm all over too, to be honest. <laughs> you're all over too, okay. Yeah. So you're interested. Yeah, we... Yeah, we, we, we actually started with two. We actually started with two altogether because it was the most interesting in meeting. Because I saw the, 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 the 45 look, texts back and forth. So you guys were very active, but I don't think you were active on all four. You kind of exploring only two, right? I mean. Yeah, two, well, two and four really was, were the ones that, uh, that stuck out at least currently given what, given our discussions and our readings thus far. Yeah. For me, I was more interested in two and three. So I guess if we, need to each pick one, maybe two, four, two, three, four for each. I mean, don't forget, we'll, we'll have other students as well and we can get you help. So, I mean, don't be too, you know, that you have to pick something right now. Maybe that's what we should do over the next two weeks, Aram. Let, let us um, um, really answer that question. Who's going to be working on what? Yeah, um, I, I leave it to leave yeah, it to you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm in and, the process uh, of getting some sub students I mean, to help them as well. So yeah, I mean, you want to choose two projects out of four, or want like two people work on the same project? It's up to you guys, and I'm happy to help like on a biweekly basis yeah. as we are doing. I mean, now. I would rather all four as our handle because obviously, you know, I mean, they could branch out to different things. So the more stuff they have to look at, the better off you are. Because at the end of the day, maybe there's yeah. something very interesting in one project, and then. You know, we could there's lots of students uh, yep. coming in all the time so we have enough to feed lots of people so yeah okay, but let us work on that and yeah. in two weeks from now we get back to you with some more direct selection sounds good and, and what are the timelines as such as in what are the timelines for the projects or do you have any ideas as in what i mean be the duration? i mean the um, but Sana is going to be, he's going to have lots of time available in front of him. Mm -hmm. Brian, I mean, we could, you know, we could, um, and that's something we need to think about to make sure that there's always somebody looking at it. I don't want it to kind of just die off. Yeah. Um, is there any yeah. hard cut, cut, like deadline for any of these uh, projects question. or it's, it's pretty sure. flexible? 
you're asking me uh yeah <laughs> sorry <laughs> not really i mean these are flexible these are open ended okay. yeah no but i mean but, the, but the, let's the, let's let's have some deadline i mean among yes. us sure. once you decide it and and then yes. we can proceed with that Correct. because it, maybe, it's always good to have deadline in mind totally as if as in you know at least come up with a couple of uh, maybe not solutions but more you know interesting arguments or or some 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 something to discuss basically like i wouldn't want to go into a meeting and you guys have nothing to say to her you should tell them hey look what i found or, or more questions and then obviously we need deadlines throughout the process i agree yeah and one more point i wanted to mention is that uh, in case you guys have something concrete you can reach out to me by mail as well i think i've given my email id to patrick and then uh, you guys can communicate by email as well and we can like bounce ideas Just slip it in the last two minutes here. I did want to ask one thing, regardless of whatever project we decide to continue, right? Um, do you think, kind of for next steps, right? What What do we do now that we've taken the time to really understand what the, what's going on? Should we go ahead and implement some version of your GitHub source code, or should we build it out by by scratch ourselves? What What would you recommend? Now you can use my GitHub code, as in you can use my GitHub code or the GitHub code from anywhere. and it's better to start uh, like do a not do a cold start and and have something uh, 